2 Corinthians chapter 3, please, in your Bible. The book of 2 Corinthians. We've been studying the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're in the third chapter today. And we're going to cover the entire chapter. It's not a long chapter, but wow, what a powerful chapter it is. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in your Bible. And let me read a few verses for us, and then I'll introduce our title, and we'll jump right into it. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and look, if you would, at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 1. And keep your Bible open, if you would. I think it's important that as we give you the message week by week that you see it, that you see it. And honestly, my messages are, are pretty predictable once you've been around my preaching a little bit. Here's the way it always works. Okay, uh, I will give you a point, and then I'll show you where that point comes from in the Bible, because that's what matters. We call that explain. So I'll try to explain a point, show you where it comes from in the Bible, and then I'll illustrate it. I'll, I'll find a way to make it understandable through an illustration, and then I'll apply it. Here's what we can do with that truth. And, th and that's it. Then I'll move on to the next point. We'll do it again. So we explain it, we illustrate it, we apply it. It's just a really simple way to look at the truth of God's word. So look at verse number one, where it says, do we, Paul is writing for himself and the others that are serving with him, he said, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Now understand that back in those days, when one would go to a church, uh, he would bring with him a letter of commendation, or we would call it a letter of recommendation. So today, uh, we know each other through social media. We know each other through, through email. We, we live in a, in a mobile society. We have modern technology. But back in Bible days, if you were to go to a church, chances are they've never seen you before. Chances are you've never been there before. So how does a church know if somebody is reputable? How do they know if this is somebody I should be caring for? Well, people would carry with them letters of recommendation. And that was the way they would do it. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote many of these. Uh, Romans chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, the book of 3 John. I mean, these are all examples of letters of recommendation. So this is not a bad thing. What Paul is asking in chapter 3, it, it, he's not saying that I, sh I should not have had a letter of recommendation. What he's saying is, do I need another one? You know me. I, I visited you. I started this church. We know each other well. I led you to Christ. I was with you every day. I discipled you. Do I need to reintroduce myself to you? Do I need somebody else to tell you that I'm a good guy? Shouldn't you know that already? Look at verse number one. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of letters of recommendation or commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? I mean, do we really have to go back to square one in our relationship? Verse number two. Ye are, ye are our epistle. You, you are our letter. I don't need a letter from you. You don't need a letter from me. You are the letter. You are the letter. You are the letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men. People look at your life. People look at your salvation testimony. People look at the way that you live. People look at your Christian testimony. Then they know our influence. We, we've, our story has been written on your life. Our influence is all on your life. Verse number three, he explains it, for as much as ye are manifestly, that means evidently, declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, like the Ten Commandments, but in fleshly or fleshy tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. We're not trying to make a big deal about ourselves. This wasn't like, we're not saying, hey, look at what we did. Look at the, look at the work we did. Look at how great we are. No, no, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, but to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So I want to talk to, uh, this morning about getting help in the craziness of ministry. Getting help in the craziness of ministry. So the, the fact is, all of us are in ministry. If you, if you are a child of God, you are in ministry. Don't look at me as, okay, well, Pastor Skelly, he's in the ministry and we're not. That's not. There's no dichotomy in the Bible of spiritual and secular. There is none. Every single one of us, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are called to serve him full time. 
Now, some of us do that in our workplace as a plumber or as a businessman or as a, a government employee, and some of us do it vocationally in, in church, but we are all full-time Christians. We are all full-time ministers. And how many of us understand that in our full-time ministry for the Lord, sometimes it gets pretty crazy, right? It gets crazy. Just ask any one of our teachers first week of school how crazy it can be. It's crazy. Yeah, it gets crazy. And for the Apostle Paul, it got crazy in some crazy ways. So in chapter 1, it got so crazy, he said, uh, I, I think I'm going to die. I mean, I honestly think I'm going to die. I, I, I'm going through so many outside problems in my life, and he describes some of them, like wild beasts at Ephesus, like uh, I've been arrested by the Jewish authorities, like there's a riot in town, like I'm fearful for my own life. I, I don't think I'm going to make it. I mean, that's the language of chapter 1. And then add to that the fact that these people who should be an encouragement to him, the, these Corinthian believers that he's invested in, that he, he's led to Christ, that he's discipled, who ought to be a, uh, a silver lining in this dark cloud in Paul's life, uh, they are adding insult to injury. Because Paul's dealing with all of these external problems, and now you've got these Corinthians that should be helping him, should be encouraging him, and they are questioning him. They question his travel plans. Like, can we trust you, Paul? Or they're questioning his authority. They're questioning his influence. There's a whole faction in Corinth that's, that's saying he's an imposter. The Apostle Paul's dealing with this craziness. I have to admit that in my 33 years of pastoral ministry, I've had my share of crazy, you know. And some of you are part of that story, some of that, that share of crazy. I remember one time in our church in Pennsylvania, and I, I hesitate to say this with my wife in the room, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I was kissed on the lips by another woman. Yeah, she was a little bit educationally slow, um, great lady in our church, and she'd greet me every week. We're in the, middle, we're in the lobby in the church, we're talking, there's hundreds of people. She looked at me, she said, Pastor Skelly, she grabbed me by both sides of my face and laid the lip lock on me. I said, what do you do after that? You know, well, God bless you. I mean, what do you do? <laughs> you know, I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> I mean, there was another time I was preaching at the old building at Locust Street, and I, I'm, I mean, I'm waxing eloquent in the middle of my Sunday morning message, and the back door opens, that's the door to the outside. Now, all of our people, we had no parking in that church, no parking. Had people parked on the streets, and inevitably, you parked in front of somebody's house and took their parking space. Even though it's public parking, it's their parking space. And so it was one night that one man had come home after working all night to his house, and the parking space in front of his house was taken by one of our church members, and he had had it. So he walked in the back door in the middle of a message, came right down the center idol of the church. He was drunk as a skunk, and, and he is yelling and screaming and using words that we just don't use in church. And I mean, and if it weren't for two ushers that were on duty that kind of tackled him and took him out, I, I would not be here today. It was crazy. It was crazy. We had a, an evangelistic crusade one year, and the evangelist was up preaching in the middle of the message, and people are into the message, and all of a sudden, uh, I see in the corner of my eye this mouse running across the front of the auditorium. And just as soon as I saw it, the front two rows of the church saw it, and it started going under the pews. And we're like, ah! I mean, you talk about revival. We had revival. I mean, people are, are feeling it. That, that The spirit was in that room. And one of the guys in our church, I'll never forget it, he jumped up, ran over, grabbed the mouse, went to the side emergency door of the church, opened the door, threw the mouse out, looked at the preacher and said, go. <laughs> He's my hero. I mean, crazy. I was preaching at a teen camp one year in North Carolina, and one of the old camps, and I was on the platform, and they built the platform up high, but the rafters were low, and the rafters were right here. And I'm preaching to about 200 teenagers, and I'm, I am not making this up. I am preaching on the devil. I'm preaching about the devil, and the devil wants to tempt you, and the devil wants to destroy you, and the, de the devil, you know, and, I, and they, I, they are like doing this. The devil. And I'm thinking, well, I'm really getting through to them. I wasn't getting through to them. There was a black snake on the rafter that was right by my head as I'm preaching on the devil. Are you ready for this? The same guy that did the mouse was at that camp. He came up, grabbed the snake. I said, he's my hero times two. Crazy. 
Crazy things happen in ministry. Those are funny, crazy things. But you know, sometimes the crazy things that happen to us aren't funny. Sometimes the crazy things that happen are, Lord, Lord, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? And that's where Paul is. And Paul helps us, the Holy Spirit, obviously, through Paul, helps us to understand a framework of mind, a framework of thinking, when we're just experiencing the craziness of ministry. Let me give you some thoughts. First of all, if you're experiencing craziness in ministry, then learn to keep your ego in check. It's not all about you. You know, so sometimes when we are criticized or misrepresented by people that we think ought to know better, by people that ought to be on our team, sometimes when we feel like we've been slighted because I'm working hard for the Lord, it's not turning out the way I thought it should, sometimes that, that actually gives us a measure of pride. And sometimes we, we get into self-defense mode. And self-defense mode is just another way of saying self-commendation. Look at how good I am. Look, I don't deserve this. Look what I have done. And Paul, Paul, Paul said, I'm not going to do that. Matter of fact, we dare not make ourselves like those who commend themselves. We dare not make ourselves like those that measure themselves by themselves. Because that's not wise. We are not going to do that. Not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but thinking soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. In fact, when the Apostle Paul thought of himself, he thought of himself in humble terms. I'm less than the least of all saints. I, I am the chief of sinners. I, I'm not worthy to be called a saint. But the Apostle Paul just had a healthy dose of humility, didn't he? He wasn't a, a self-promoter, a self Commender. That's not the way the Apostle Paul looked at himself. But sometimes trials, sometimes criticism, it can make us do that. It can get us into, I'm pretty good. I don't deserve. And we have to learn to keep our ego in check. I love the extended metaphor that Paul gives in verses 1 through 6 because the metaphor is this. It's like a letter. Like the ministry is like the writing of a letter. And you are the letter, Corinthians. You are the letter. You're, you're the letter that's being read. So the ministry is like a letter. And then he tells all the people that are, Christ is the author, right? Verse number three, you, you are manifestly, manifestly uh, the epistle of Christ. So who authored the Corinthian letter? Christ did. Christ is the one that the authored. Yeah, well, that's why when Paul went there, he said, we, we preach Christ and him crucified. He's the author. He, you don't need Paul, you need Christ. You don't need Skelly, you need Christ. Uh, we don't need Faith Baptist, we need Christ. You know, the Faith Baptist is an important place as we preach Christ. Pastor Skelly might be important as I preach Christ. But it's Christ that we need. It's Christ that we need. So Christ is the author of the letter. And then, uh, to extend the metaphor, the Apostle Paul said, so Jesus is the author. This is the way Paul views ministry. Uh, Jesus is the author, but n number two, um, the Holy Spirit is the ink. Isn't that what he says in verse number three? He said, well, we, you're the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of God. So it's not ink, it's not a physical letter that Jesus is coming to town and writing on a piece of paper. No, Jesus is writing with the Holy Spirit upon people's hearts. And so Jesus is the author, the Holy Spirit is the ink, and the heart is the paper. So Corinthian believers, you, have a, you are a letter. Jesus has written his story of salvation. Jesus has written his story of redemption, and he has left his mark in your life via the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is the inked stamp of Jesus on your life. And so people can read your life. Why? Because Jesus has authored through the Holy Spirit salvation in your life and ought to show up. You say, okay, well, then Pastor Skelly, where's the Apostle Paul? I thought you said Paul is framing himself in this. He is. So who's Paul? If Jesus is the author, if the Holy Spirit is the ink, if the heart is the paper, then who is the Apostle Paul? Paul is, Paul is the pen. Look at verse number three again. He said, for as much as ye manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, he's the author, ministered by us. So if Christ is the author and he's writing a letter with the ink of the Holy Spirit on the paper of the heart of people, he's using the instrument, the instrument is the pen. 
The instrument is the pen. Now, I happen to have a beautiful given to me, a beautiful Mont Blanc pen. Everyone say, ooh. <laughs> Everyone say, ah. Ah, I mean, this is, this is a very important pen, very important. Very expensive, so I'm told. I would never buy one, but it was purchased for me. Praise the Lord. My name is Jimmy. I take what you give me. So there, there it is. <laughs> How important of a letter could this pen write? Well, it just depends on who uses it. It depends on what they have to say. In fact, can I just say this? I think that who uses the pen is probably even more important than the pen. Right? Like, I could write you a love letter, and you don't care. So, so what? You don't want a love letter from me. Or your, your, your sweetheart could write you a letter, and they could use, like, a Bic pen. It wouldn't make a difference, because it's not about the pen. Right? It's about who uses the pen and what is said by the person who uses the pen. Do you see what Paul's doing here? Paul's saying, listen, I'm not going to commend myself. I'm not going to get someone else to commend me. I'm not going to self-promote. I'm not going to get other people to defend me. You know what I'm going to? I'm just going to keep on letting Jesus use me. I'm going to let him be the author. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit be the ink. I'm going to let this continue to be relational. And I'm going to see myself for what I am. I'm just the pen. I'm just the table waiter. I'm just the bond slave. I'm just the farmer. I'm just the builder. I'm just the chiefs of sinners. I'm just the mouthpiece. I'm just a voice, said John. Well, we need to frame ourselves properly. We need to frame ourselves properly. Check your ego at the door. It will help you in ministry. Number two, not only do we see that we need to keep our ego in check, but notice verse number seven of our text. Actually, verse number six, where the Bible says, who, this is God, who, who also hath made us, now watch this, he's made us able. So he, he is sufficient, we are not sufficient. So in sufficiency, God has equipped us with, he's made us able to, he hath made us able, watch this, able ministers, that term means table waiter. He has made us an able waiter, a minister of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now what is Paul saying here? That, that God has made, equipped us to be ministers of the New Testament. So I think first of all he said, hey, check your ego. Check your ego. Keep your ego in check. Keep your ego in check. You're just the pen. He's the, Jesus is the author. Jesus is doing his work. Uh, you're just the instrument. Okay? But, but secondly, uh, uh, stay focused on the gospel. God, God has made you a minister of the New Testament. Now, what, what is the New Testament? You say, okay, Pastor Skelly, I know that answer. That's the second half of the Bible, right? The second, New Testament. No, the, what does New Testament mean? What does New Testament mean? New Testament could also be said New Covenant. Same word. Testament, covenant. What is it? What's the New Testament? The New Testament is the story of Jesus. The story of the fact that Jesus, unlike the Old Testament where you needed an animal to be sacrificed, Jesus is the sacrifice. Unlike the Old Testament where a high priest had to offer the sacrifice, Jesus is the high priest. Unlike the Old Testament where the sacrifice covered sin, Jesus cleanses sin. Unlike the Old Testament where the sacrifice had to be offered again and again, Jesus was the once for all offering for sin. So the New Testament is the promise that God will do something relationally, what was done transactionally in the Old Testament. The law was never intended to save people. Do you understand that? The law was always intended to kill people. Say, really? Yeah. That's what the law does. The law kills. The law shows you that you're worthy of death. The law indicts you for your sin. The law shows you how bad you are. In fact, that's why the law was given. The law was added, Paul told us in Galatians 3, because of transgressions. In other words, people, the Jews were living and they were thinking, we're not as bad as, as we're not as bad as we think we are. Or we, we, they weren't as bad as what they thought they were. And so what, what, what they were, they were worse than they thought they were. There we go. And so the apostle, so, so God had to show them how bad they were. So what did he do? He gave them a mirror. 
because the mirror shows us who we are. You want to see who you are? Look in the mirror. If you really want to see who you are, look at one of those mirrors they have in the hotel, you know, with the, 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 the 100 power, with the, the light, and you see all these, you know, your face looks like the Grand Canyon. It's like, whoa, is that me? Yeah, that's you, okay? That's what the law does. The law shows you, you. It shows you the center that you are. And it, can, it does nothing to save you. All it does is point out your problems. All it does is point out your faults. All it does is show you how guilty you are. You know what the law is? The law is the first two points of the Romans road. You're a sinner, you're going to hell. Who wants to hear that? You're a sinner, you're going to hell. That's the law. The law tells you you're a sinner and you're going to pay for your sin. You're a, sin, you're a sinner and you're guilty. That's what the law says. Now, I don't like that. You probably don't like that, but it's true. That's what the law does. The, lo- the letter killeth, but the spirit... That's what, the Spirit, that's how we're saved. We're saved by the regeneration of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. The new covenant, the new covenant brings, brings life from death. The law can kill, but the New Testament brings alive. It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And so what the Apostle Paul said, and that's our job. He has made us able ministers of the New Testament. We get to tell people that news. We get to tell people that the answer is Jesus Christ. We get to tell people that there is hope for, for a sinful person. There's hope for a death row inmate. There's hope, and the hope is Jesus Christ. So I know you're going through it. I know you got problems in your life. I know people are criticizing you, but guess what? The gospel is still true, and the gospel still works, and we ought to stay focused on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder sometimes if we, well, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in my third point. So n- n- number one, check your ego at the door. Keep your ego in check. Number two, stay focused on the gospel. Number three, would you look at verse number seven? This is so interesting. I'm going to read four verses for you, four verses, and I want you to see if you can detect what word is reiterated. Matter of fact, there are two words that are reiterated, okay? There's going to be a final examination. Everyone's got to participate. Let's see if you can see which two words are reiterated. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but try to get it, okay? Verse number seven. But if the ministration of death, that's the law, written and engraved in stones, like the Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Did you notice the reiteration of any words in those verses? It's like glory, 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 glorious, glorious, glorious. What's so glorious? What's so glory? Hey, what Paul is saying is, here's what's glorious. Here's the glory. The glory is, man, we were hell-bound sinners. And the law condemned us, and there was no answer. But then Jesus showed up, and Jesus paid the penalty of sin for us. And he paid our debt upon the cross, and he fulfilled uh, the righteousness of the law that we could not fulfill. And he offered us salvation as a free gift, and we can experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and receive the gift righteousness of Jesus by faith. Hey, that is wonderful. I think what the Apostle Paul is helping us to see in the craziness of ministry, in the craziness of ministry, is that we, that we should not lose the wonder of it all. Yeah. Don't lose the wonder. Don't lose your sense of wonder. You know what I think what's happened to many believers is we're, we're in church, and here's what happens, right? Here's what happens. We get saved. Remember that day when you trusted Christ as your Savior? Remember the tears? Remember the joy? Remember the sense of relief? Remember the burden that rolled off your back? Remember that? Remember? Can you remember that? In your heart, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, there it was. But over the years, here's what happens. All of what we experience begins to migrate. It goes from here, starts to make its way up, and now it's all here. We know big words now. We know words like justification, and we know words like sanctification, and we know words like glorification and propitiation and 
imputation and we can talk about the hypostatic union and we know what redemption means and we and we don't tell anyone about Jesus anymore and we don't feel a lump in our throat anymore there's never a tear that trickles down our te- cheek anymore because we've lost the wonder of it we, we've lost the wonder we've become academic we've, come, we've become mechanical we, we've become robotic. We've lost our sense of wonder. And the Apostle Paul said, don't lose the wonder of it all. Don't lose it. Hey, stay amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. How marvelous. How wonderful. Right? Where is that? Have you ever heard that song, I'm Amazed That He Loves Me? Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. If you've never heard that, get home. Don't do it now. Don't do it now. Put your phones away, okay? Go home, look up the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, I'm Amazed, and just listen to it. Just to turn, turn everything, turn all the distractions off, just listen. I'm, are you amazed that he loves you? Are you amazed? I, I think there are some, there, there are some, Results of amazement. Notice with me the amazement of the gospel. What does the amazement of the gospel produce in my life? I think, first of all, I think about its provision. The amazement of the gospel. If I'm amazed by the gospel, I'm amazed at its provision. What, what the gospel can do. What can the gospel do? The gospel can, can take a dead man and make him alive. The gospel can take a lost man and make him found. The gospel can take a blind man and make him see. It provides Not only uh, the amazement of what it provides, but how about its permanence, how it will last. You know, the the law was fading. The law was a temporary thing. The law was a stopgap to show people how bad they were, but the gospel is a forever thing. Uh, Salvation is a forever thing. But once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're saved, God has a permanent plan for your life. Be amazed by its provision. Be amazed by its permanence. Hey, the amazement of the gospel ought to cause you to proclaim it. It's proclamation. But if you truly understand the glory of the gospel, you want to tell somebody. You truly understand it. I remember when I first went to Israel. Man, I was just moved by it. Like, I, I wish you could... Go with me on my first trip. I didn't, I didn't know anything. All I knew was, I can't believe I'm here. Pinch me, I can't believe I'm here. I'd sit on the Sea of Galilee, I can't believe I'm here. Everywhere I went, I wept. I went to Nazareth, I wept. I went to the Sea of Galilee, I wept. I went to Jerusalem, I wept. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I'd get up early in the morning and go out walking every morning. I, I'd stay up late at night and go back in Jerusalem and just wander around. I couldn't believe I was there. But you know, now I go to now I go to Israel. I take people with me, and sometimes I'll go to a site, and I'll say, yeah, go, go check up there. You'll like that. And I check my text messages. No, no, go check that out. No, I'm not going to go out tonight, but you, know, you go to the Western Wall. Nice, it's beautiful. You'll love it. You'll really have a sense of, you know, I've got some emails. You know what's happened? I've just become used to it. I wonder if that's what, what's happened with our walk with the Lord. I, I wonder if we've just become used to it. Paul said, don't lose the wonder of it all. Hey, is there help for craziness in ministry? Sure, yeah. Check your ego at the door. Check your ego. Hey, stay focused on the gospel. Don't lose your sense of wonder. And then finally this morning, would you look at verse number 17? Actually, I want you to just see this exciting passage in verse number 12 where Paul actually he actually contrasts his proclamation with Moses' proclamation. So he says, verse number 12, he says, seeing then that we have such a hope, knowing this wonderful thing, having this great confidence that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, knowing what the gospel is, knowing the New Testament, what it means, that we use great plainness of speech, but we want to give the simple, bold gospel message we want everyone to know. But watch this, verse number 13, not as Moses so that's not what Moses did. Moses did, not, Moses did not let everyone see what he saw. He couldn't. Because the Bible says here in verse number 13, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, 
that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of what, that which was abolished. Their minds were blinded until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart, talking about the Jews. Nevertheless, when it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, hey, listen, remember when Moses went to meet God? Remember Moses spent time with God? When he came down from meeting with God, in Exodus chapter 34, his face was shining. It was glowing. And when he came down, you say, that's a great thing. People are going to see the reflection of God upon his life. Is that not good for people to see the reflection of God upon your life? But wait a minute. The God that Moses saw was the lawgiver. So the reflection was the reflection of righteousness and judgment. And so when Moses came down and they saw that glow, Aaron said, oh, oh. And Joshua said, oh, oh. And the leader said, oh, oh, no, no, we can't look on God. We can't even look at a reflection of God. We're afraid. And Moses had to put the veil over. Why? Because they couldn't see God in his fullness. They couldn't see God in even a reflection of him. Why? Because of their sinful guilt. They couldn't see him. But with Christ, it's different. Why? Because he has satisfied God's righteousness. He has satisfied God's righteous demands. He he comes to us in love. Now we can say we can behold Jesus. That's why it says in chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 6. It says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You can look right at him. The Bible says, then the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. A God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed an heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory. Boy, we can look right at Jesus today. Why? Because he paid sin's price. Well, what a great, wonderful opportunity we have. Which leads me to my last point. Don't lose the wonder of it all. But finally, this morning, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Would you look at our last two verses, please? Verse number 17. The Bible says, now, the Lord is that spirit. That's a reference to the fact that God is a triune God. God, the Father, is God. God the Son, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Three, one God and three persons, right? So here, the Lord is that Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And where the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is, there is liberty. So if you're saved, the Spirit of God lives in your life, you have liberty. Liberty for what? Liberty for two things. Number one, liberty to do the things that you ought to do that you couldn't do when you were in sin. Freedom now to live an unshackled life. For Jesus, power and victory potentially over sin in your life. That's wonderful. There's liberty. But also liberty, freedom to go to God. Just as Moses could go to God and take the veil off, so you can go to God and take the veil off. But the difference is this. When Moses went to God, the veil was off. But when Moses went to the people, the veil was on. And our job as New Testament believers is to go to God with the veil off and then to go to people with the veil off. To reflect Christ to a lost and dying world. That's what Paul's saying. No, we use plainness of speech, not like Moses. See, our problem is we got the veil on. Our problem is, that our problem is we spend time with the Lord, but no one else knows it. Our problem is we walk with God, we come to the church when no one, no one else knows it. Our problem is we know the gospel, but no one else knows it. Our problem is we have this personal, private walk with God but we don't ever tell anybody about it. No, we take the veil off in private and we put the veil on in public. And what God, what Paul is saying here is, hey, look in the face of Jesus and then keep the veil off. Look at verse number 18. But we all with open face. You know what that means? That means unveiled face. That means no, no mask on. We with open face beholding That means a fixed and permanent gaze. Beholding as in a glass, as in a mirror. That's the old English word. As in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Because before Christ, when you looked in the mirror, it was the mirror of the law. And guess what you saw when you looked in the mirror of the law? You saw the ugliness of yourself. 
You saw the ugliness of sin. It's like I see myself and I don't like myself. I see my sinful habits and I don't like my sinful habits. The, the law showed you the you you didn't want to see. But now that you're saved, God has a different mirror for you to look at. And so it's a strange mirror. Because the mirror that you look at now, when you look in the mirror, God doesn't show you you. He shows you what you can and will be. He shows you Christ. He shows you the glory of the Lord. When you look in the mirror, you look and see the face of Christ. When you look, at, you look in the mirror, he says, this is who you are. This is who you are positionally. This is what you will be one day in glorification. This is what I'm making you to be like day by day. This is, what, this is the image I'm forming you into. This is your ideal. This is what you will be like. This is the way I see you. Boy, what a wonderful truth. So the Bible says, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Watch this. We're changed. We're changed into the same image. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us is changing us to look more like that. So keep looking at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is changing you into his image. He's helping you to become more like him, to think like him, to respond like him, to have his attitudes, to have his priorities, uh, to be like Jesus. That's the purpose of your Christian life, is that the Holy Spirit of God would use the Word of God to make you, the child of God, more like the Son of God. That's the very purpose. So here it is, ready? Beholding Jesus changes us. Beholding Jesus changes us. Now, we get it all wrong. We get it all wrong. We feel like, i got to change myself so I can behold Jesus. i get my life right, and i go to church. i get some things right in my life, then I'll start walking with God. you got it all backwards. No, you behold Jesus, and he'll get your life right. You spend time with Jesus, and he'll do the work in you. It's not the work you do for him that makes you behold him. It's beholding him that get, enables him to do the work in you that needs to be done. Right? You do the beholding, he will do the transforming. You do the beholding, he will do the transforming. Your job is to keep your eyes firmly affixed upon Jesus Christ. That's your job. Why? Because beholding Jesus changes us in three ways. First of all, I would say change is a product. Change is a product. Change is not something you do. Change is something he does. Well, i got to change my life. You're not going to change your life. You've tried a thousand times, and look at you. You're still where you were. You're still doing that same old thing. Quit trying to change yourself. No, the answer is not you change yourself. The answer is get a relationship, a real relationship, a dynamic relationship, not a two-minute-a-day relationship. Start looking at Jesus. He will change you. He will. He will. Change is a product. Change is a process. Didn't happen overnight. From glory to glory. You know what that means? An ever-increasing glory. You know what that means? It's going to glow more and more. Because some of us right now are like a 10-watt bulb, right? But I'll tell you what, from glory to glory. As we grow in Christ, we shine. This little light of mine, right? Hide it under a bushel. No. No, I'm going to let it shine. From glory to glory, it shines more and more and more until that perfect day. That's the way it works. Why? Because change, change, it's a product. Change, it's a, it's a process. Sometimes people say, oh, Pastor Skelly, you've changed. And my answer, I try to let my answer always be the same. Pastor Skelly, you've changed. Here's what I try to say. I hope so. I hope so. I hope I've changed. <laughs> I hope I'm not what I used to be. I hope I love him more. I hope I'm more forgiving. I hope I'm less judgmental. I hope I'm less full of myself. I hope I'm more compassionate. Yeah, I hope I've changed. Isn't that the point? Change is a product. Change is a process. Watch this. Change is the purpose. Change is God's purpose for your life is to change you. That's his purpose. You do the beholding, he does the transforming. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You know what that means? That means God has made it a sure thing that every single believer in Jesus will be made ultimately just like Jesus. God's working on you. And he's using even all of these crazy things in ministry 
and all these crazy misunderstandings and all this crazy criticism, these crazy trials. He's using all of it to change you, to make you more like him. Wow. Now, I want to confess the sin. I lied to you. I said we were only going to do chapter 3, but I lied. I'm going to do one half of one verse in chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Actually, we're going to do the whole verse. (laughs) Two lies in two seconds. Therefore, do you see that? So based upon all of what we just learned, seeing we have this ministry, this crazy ministry, this crazy, glorious, wonderful ministry, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, watch this, we faint not. You know what Paul says? Check your ego at the door. Stay focused on the gospel. Don't lose your sense of wonder. Keep looking at Jesus. And listen, don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit. It's crazy. I know what they're saying. I know what's going on. Don't you dare quit. It is worth it.